as volunteers uh, make their willingness known to volunteer here for the church, we don't want to have to facilitate an actual meeting every time, like if it's just one or two people. So we want to video record this so that they can have this access online or through a DVD to say, hey, watch this training, fill out the paperwork, and then we're good to go. So I hope you don't mind that um, the backs of your heads are going to be... <laughs> no. Anyways, but what I want to do first is just first of all say thank you. I recognize that um, the church is <coughs> assembled in such a way that the success of its mission is completely dependent upon volunteers. It's completely dependent upon people who are just willing to give their time, willing to give their effort, willing to give their sweat, willing to give up their resources for the success and fulfillment of God's commission. And so each and every one of you, rec like you represent sacrifice. You represent a giving of yourself and a giving of time. And um, I just want you to know that's really valuable. It doesn't go unnoticed. And if it does feel unnoticed at times, um, I apologize for that. And so we just want to affirm you and all that you've done, all that you have yet to do for God's kingdom. So thank you so much. Uh, we're also going to begin with uh, a word of prayer. I know that there are probably questions on your minds even at the onset of things. And I would encourage you as we... As we go throughout this next 45 minutes or so, write questions down because we want to have time at the end for, for all sorts of questions, okay? Um, but we're going to have a time of prayer, and I want to pray for each other and also the, the people that we minister to, uh, especially the children that we minister to, okay? Because this is, this is kind of what's motivating this training today. We want to be intentional and accountable about the ways that we interact with the young people. Let's pray. Father. We're thankful for the reality that at any time, in any place, and in anywhere, we can call upon your name. And I thank you just for the prayers that have been lifted up for each other and for the children of our congregation. God, we know that such a deep burden on your heart was to let the little children come to you, and that nothing would forbid them, whether um, consciously or unconsciously, whether verbally or non-verbally. God, we as um, ministers and as volunteers, we, we don't want to place roadblocks for the young people in our church family. And anything and everything we do, God, we just want to open up the floodgates. I thank you so much for those who have gathered here. I know they could be hundreds and dozens of other places, but right now, I thank you that you, they've invested their time here, and I pray that you would reward them richly. I pray that uh, any questions would be settled. Um, I pray that we would actually learn things here today and that we would experience a spirit of unity and moving forward as a church family. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Again, thank you so much for being here. I don't know what it is about the weekly rhythm, but Sunday mornings, my mind is still kind of in a fog. <laughs> so... Uh, we'll try to move quickly. We're, we're hoping to be done with the presentation by 10.45 so that we can open up the floor for questions and answers. Um, after which we can, well, I'll let Nina explain the rest. But um, yeah, after those questions and answers, hopefully by 11, 11.15, you'll feel free like, hey, I think I'm, I'm ready to go. So uh, you've got a little checklist here. Um, it kind of gives you the main things that, that we're hoping to receive from each of our volunteers. Um, and right now, this is just kind of an intentional process that we're going through. Now, before we get into all the details, I just kind of want to share with us why we're doing what we're doing. It's always kind of one of those questions. Like, if we don't know why we're doing it, we're just kind of going along with emotions. And so I want us to kind of understand why we're doing what we're doing, um, specifically about this child protection plan. But not just about the child protection plan, but why are we doing what we're doing as a church? Uh, recently, you started to notice that in our, in our bulletins, we've started to print what our mission is and what our vision is. Um, interestingly, this wasn't something that was definitely articulated when I arrived here six months ago. And um, it became apparent to me that this would really help. It would re really help so that, you know, whatever ministry capacity we're doing, we actually know what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so we gathered a group of leaders together, and over a period of about six weeks, we met five different, um, five different sessions for nearly a couple hours each time in prayer and study and in brainstorming, and we were simply asking God, please, 
help us understand why you've called Parkwood into existence. And so um, after that, that really challenging process, but it was a good process nonetheless, this is what we articulated. Maybe we can just read this together, okay? Let's read the mission. Our mission, to reveal Jesus Christ to the world now in preparation for his soon return. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. Yeah. I mean, we know why the Seventh-day Adventist Church exists, at least I hope we do, that it exists to proclaim the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tribe, tongue, and people, right? Yeah, um, but within the world church, why did God call Parkwood into existence? And that's why we were asking the question, you know, what do our ministries have as a goal? What's that definite aim we're going for? And I believe we're aiming to reveal Jesus Christ Amen. so that people can be prepared for his soon return. Okay, so if we're successful in doing that as a church, in all of our ministries, what would we expect to see? Well, we would expect to see this vision. Let's read the vision together. Our vision, to belong to Christ in a healthy church family where every member is valued and loved, thoroughly equipped and joyfully involved in linking others to Christ. So when we're revealing Jesus Christ, we ought to see people belonging to Christ, right? We ought to see people actually experiencing union with Jesus, and not just singularly, not just individually, but in a community where every member is valued and loved, where every member is thoroughly equipped, joyfully involved in linking others to Christ. And I think you, as volunteers, you all understand, this is just an, an opportunity for us to be more thoroughly equipped, okay? So let's see, if this is what Parkwood is trying to do as a church, um, why are we doing what we're doing today? Why, why go over this child protection plan and all these kinds of things? Well, if we're going to take seriously to reveal Jesus Christ, we've got to recognize that there are certain things that don't reveal Jesus Christ, right? There are certain behaviors, there are certain attitudes, there are certain ways in which we can skew the picture of Jesus, and this world is full of it. And so we as a church and we as church volunteers, we want to be intentional and accountable to make sure that we understand how to appropriately reveal Jesus Christ. Yeah? Um, regarding our vision, we want to be part of a healthy church family, free of abuse, free of offense, um, where every member is valued and loved. And that includes, especially includes, our children. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so that's why we're doing what we're doing today. We're going over this something called a child protection plan that every church in our conference and other conferences are encouraged to adopt um, as an intentional and accountable way to ensure that we're revealing Jesus Christ. So I'll, I'll go ahead and, and lead, lead into Nina's presentation here. And uh, yeah, again, if you have questions throughout this presentation, please write them down. And towards the end, we'll have a chance to address those. Um, how many of you have already read the Child Protection Plan? This was available through an email from me. It is available on the website for Parkwood Church. If you could raise your hand, I'd just like to know who's already familiar with it. I love it. Thank you guys for being prepared. Um, because the document is lengthy, the original was over nine pages long, um, I tried to save some paper so that document is not in your handout. Today's presentation, I will highlight specific points from that plan, and the document is available here for you to read in person. Again, it's also available on our website if you would like to refer to it, and um, I can send you an email if you haven't gotten one from me already. Thank you to Godfrey, who is um, our technician <laughs> with the equipment today, and he's gonna have the document up on the screen, and we're just gonna highlight some specific details for today's meeting. The first important point that we would like to stress is that the church is committed to making ministries free from abuse of all kinds. And then our organizational responsibilities. The church will exercise reasonable care in the selection and supervision of volunteers including training and orienting volunteers so they, may be, so they may properly supervise and or carry out the ministry. That is this um, training that you are attending today. With providing each volunteer with a written copy of the child protection guidelines, 
for volunteers adopted by the church. Requiring each volunteer to sign and abide by the volunteer ministry code of conduct adopted by the church. Taking appropriate corrective action to counsel, discipline, or remove a volunteer when necessary. And I think that statement explains itself. All volunteers will be required to participate in training selected by the Central California Conference of Seventh-day Adventists in the identification and reporting of child abuse and neglect. And if they are not mandated reporters under the act, are encouraged to report known or reasonably suspected instances of such child abuse or neglect to the agency spe specified. How many of you, because of your employment, know for a fact that you are a mandated reporter? You are aware of that term and you understand what that means, that the law requires you because of your employment to report child abuse or neglect that you suspect. Because we are all here as volunteers, this is not our, our primary employment, we are all ethical, ethical reporters, which means that it is our ethical duty to recognize and report child abuse when we suspect it. If any volunteer becomes of but becomes aware of or has reasonable suspicion of inappropriate conduct by another volunteer and involving a minor, he or she shall, in, st in strict compliance and subject to legal requirements, promptly report that matter to the church pastor or the Central Val California Conference Human Resources Department. Volunteer selection and management. No known sex offender will be allowed to serve as a volunteer for the church. All prospective volunteers, regardless of previous experience, shall complete the training and screening procedure selected by the conference. You are all compliant because you're here today. Volunteer background screening and training will be renewed for each volunteer every three years. The volunteer selection and training process will be administered by the Church Volunteer Service Administrator. Back to 5-7. The Church is responsible for the cost of implementing its background screening and training procedures. How many of you have already visited the website shieldthevulnerable.org? Thank you. Um, that normally, or that does have a $30 charge. And when you register online, it's automatically charged to Parkwood Church. Um, we wanted to make sure that we didn't say, thank you for vol volunteering for Parkwood. It's only going to cost you $30. <laughs> we um, will take donations if you'd like to make a donation to uh, reimburse the church for those charges. But that's not a requirement, and we appreciate you taking this online training. Um, protecting confidentiality. We do want you to know that the church and all of our parties involved here will treat all matters with due regard for confidentiality. We do want to keep your information and the information of others that are in this program confidential. So the orientation and training. The church will conduct orientation meetings to train volunteers. Here we are. The orientation will cover the following information. The church's mission and the expectations to accomplish that mission, the code of conducts and guidelines to be followed by volunteers in relation to supervising and interacting with minors, appropriate physical contact with minors, appropriate supervision of minors, and openness and observation of activities. Those are the highlights from the very long document that our church has accepted for its protection plan. Again, um, this document is available online on the website via email if you'd like to get it from me. And here at the church, make sure that you read the document uh, before the end of today's session. And we'll have that available for you. Available on the church website. Church website. Thanks, Ian. Okay, so there are, as you've kind of already seen, there are several different documents. One is the one that we just had on the screen, is the Child Protection Plan. And then now in your hands is the Child Protection Guidelines for Volunteers. So what we're going to do today, okay, <laughs> what we're going to do for the next few minutes in this stage is we're actually just going to read through this. 
because something that uh, we want us to be able to sign at the end of the day is something called the Code of Conduct, which just simply says I'm familiar with the plan, and I've read through the guidelines. So we want to give us the opportunity right now to read through the guidelines. Again, any of these things, or the way it's stated, uh, what it really means, uh, just kind of put a pen mark next to it, and we'll try to answer those questions at the end. Okay, so how about this? Can I get three volunteers? Three volunteers to read 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3 in a loud and booming voice so that the mic can pick it up. <laughs> who's gonna do it? All right, Chanel, 1.1, who's got 1.2? Okay, Helen, and then Nancy, all right. Point two. All volunteers are expected to adhere to these guidelines to the extent reasonably possible in carrying out their church-related duties. 1.3. Failure to adhere to these guidelines may cause the church to immediately remove an individual from volunteer service. Okay. All right. Uh, not yet. You can mark it, and then at the very end, at 10.45, we'll open the floor. Thanks. All right, section two. Section two, uh, I'm going to have Nina read through this. We've got some slides along. Try to make this a little bit more interesting than just coming here and reading to each other. <laughs> I found a few slides that are going to be up on the screen. Um, general conduct. Appropriate adult supervision shall be provided at all times for minors while in the, while in the care of the church. At least two volunteers, at least one of whom shall be an adult, will supervise any minor or group of minors in the care of the church. This is also known as the two-person rule. And if it is not reasonably possible for a second volunteer to be present with an adult volunteer who is present, the adult volunteer should not be alone with a single minor. Um, a good example of this would be if a Sabbath school teacher is in a division where only one student uh, shows up for Sabbath school that morning, uh, because we're not because we need to follow the two-person rule, that class would be canceled. We would ask that student to maybe join another class, and that volunteer teacher to either go to another class or maybe come to the adult service. So that's an example of the two-person rule. If an emergency situation arises where it's necessary to be alone with a minor, another responsible volunteer shall be informed as soon as possible, if t if by telephone by telephone if necessary, and the minor's parent or guardian shall be informed of the fact that their child was alone with the volunteer, the reason for it, as soon as possible, and safe to do so. Basically, if you find yourself in that situation, just let the parents know. We just want to make sure that parents are aware of everything that's happening with their child so that we are doing our best to keep their child safe. Volunteers should not travel alone with a minor. If only one volunteer is available, there should be a minimum of two minors present for the entire journey. If an emergency situation arises where it's necessary to travel alone with a minor, minor, another responsible volunteer shall be informed as soon as possible by telephone if necessary, and the minor's parent or guardian should be informed of the fact that their child traveled alone with the volunteer and the reason for it as soon as it's possible to do so. Uh, the slide that you'll see up on the screen says, when there's at least three, we're as safe as can be. So that is just one thing to remind you that if you need to, if you're going to be traveling with minors, make sure you have at least two of the students in the car with you so that there's always three people together. Okay? If a uh, volunteer will be aware of conduct conducting activities in rooms that do not have an interior viewing area. If no such, if no such area is present, the volunteer will leave the door open during the activity to allow for easy observation by others. In a nutshell, <coughs> that means that if you're in a group with, in a room with children, please be sure that the window coverings are open, like if there's, uh, blinds or shades to have those open 
And if that's not available, leave the door open. An example would be if you go to the Pathfinder room on any time that the Pathfinders have gathered, the door is never shut tight. It's always ajar. Anybody can peek their head in the door, check on their children, or see what's happening in the room. Okay? Again, this is for our children's safety. The beneficiary does it by glass walls. Yeah. <laughs> Um, physical punishment of children is never permissible under any circumstances. Verbal abuse of, chil of children or telling jokes of a sexual nature in the presence of children is never allowed. Volunteers shall never engage or tolerate any behavior, verbal, psychological, or physical, that could reasonably be construed as bullying or abusive. All children must be treated with equal respect Favoritism is unacceptable. A disproportionate amount of time should not be spent with any particular child or group of children. Under no circumstances may volunteers use or provide minors with alcohol, tobacco, or illegal drugs. Only age-appropriate language, material, on media products such as camera phones, internet video, and activities should be used when working with minors. Sexually explicit or pornographic material is absolutely never allowed. Volunteers must not engage in inappropriate physical contact of any kind, including rough physical play, physical reprimand, and horseplay. This does not prevent appropriate contact in situations where it's necessary to ensure the safety and well-being of a child. If a child is in the parking lot and about to be hit by a car, please do use your body to move them out of harm's way. <laughs> Whenever reasonably possible, volunteers shall ask a minor permission before physically touching him or her anywhere, even when responding to a non-emergency injury or problem. Volunteers shall endeavor to have at least one volunteer working with them as care is provided. If a child falls down and scrapes their knee, Please ask them, may I put pressure on that, on that wound? It will help you feel better. Or um, if you're in a classroom situation, and you, may, I, may I adjust your ponytail for you? Get in the habit of asking for permission to touch anyone else, adults or children. Volunteers will affirm younger children only with appropriate touching by keeping hugs brief and shoulder to shoulder or side to side. Volunteers will keep hands at, not below the shoulder level. For, the very, for very young children who like to sit on laps, volunteers will encourage them to sit next to the volunteer. In case of older minors, volunteers may, will avoid unnecessary touching. We kind of have a slide for that that shows a side to side hug or shoulder to shoulder hug is appropriate where a frontal hug is inappropriate. So, um, also, if you have a child that is used to sitting on your lap or is comfortable with you sitting on your lap, um, try to develop the habit of saying, "Could I ask you to sit next to me, or please sit next to me?" You know, so we can talk or something like that. And they'll get they'll get used to that habit too. You know, you'll you'll kind of notice that a lot of this is just common sense, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of this, you know, if you have a set moral compass, you kind of recognize, okay, these are. <laughs> These are things that should be common sense or second nature. Um, it's just a matter of specifying. And um, I think it's in 1 Thessalonians. It talks about avoiding all appearance, appearance of, evil. of evil. Yeah, avoiding the appearance of evil. So that nobody could construe or reasonably be suspicious that anything um, of an immoral nature is taking place. So yeah. Okay, Nina, can you read through section 4? We're almost done. Section 4 is about trips. All trips, including day trips and overnight stays, need careful advanced planning, including adequate provision for safety in regard to transport, facilities, activities, and emergencies. Adequate insurance through the Central California Conference of Seventh-day Adventists with appropriate insurance companies should be in place prior to any trip. All trips must be pre-approved by the church board. And an appropriate written consent by a parent or guardian specifically for each trip and related activities must be obtained in advance. Advance. A copy of the trip itinerary and contact telephone numbers for leaders should be made available to parents and guardians. There, 
must be adequate gender appropriate supervision for boys and girls. Arrangements and procedures must be put in place so that rules are followed and appropriate boundaries are maintained. The provision of appropriate and adequate sleeping arrangements should be made in advance of the trip. And sleeping areas for boys and girls should be separate and supervised by two adults of the same gender as the group being supervised. So we have all successfully completed reading the guidelines uh, for the code of conduct. And so in the back of your packet were two pieces of paper that you were to fill out by the end of class or by the end of this presentation. Um, the very last paper is just your information, contact information for volunteers we need to have on file. And before that is the uh, document that states that you have read and are familiar with both the plan and the guidelines for code of conduct. Um, if it is appropriate, you may sign that now and turn it in to me. It is. Thank you. Today is June 23rd. And if you need to read the document that was highlighted at the beginning of this presentation, um, I'm going to have you join me in the committee room and we can uh, go over that document together if you need to so that you can find. Um, also, some of you may not have a computer or not feel comfortable with using the computer and still need to do the shield the vulnerable.org background check and safety training. How many of you still need that and would like to do that today? We've got at least two, three, four, five. Very good. Okay, we do have some computers available. And I'll let you go ahead. And yeah, we do out. have computers available. And what we can promise is that we can get you started. Uh, we may not be able, unless you have the time today, we may not be able to complete the whole course. There's about 58 slides that it goes through. And if you really read, um, even somewhat thoroughly, it can take up to 60 to 90 minutes. So what we'd like to do is make some computers available especially for those who may not necessarily feel comfortable actually logging into something, and we'll get you started on that so that the next time you ever get to a computer, all you need to do is click and click and click. Does that sound good? <laughs> Anyways, um, Nina's actually gonna, she's logged on to her, her account on shieldthevulnerable.org right now, and this is just a sample of some of the things that it'll do. So it's just kind of an online training course. It'll give a scenario, and you can kind of click through your way. I am going to show you how easy this program is and how informational this program is. And I'm going to let you kind of answer a question that's on the actual program with me today. Um, what is considered emotional, what is considered emotional abuse depends on the age and developmental level of a child. All children suffer emotional growing pains. But when a parent's words, acts, or emissions seriously harm the child's emotional and psychological development, that is emotional abuse. Consider the following scenario. Do you think they indicate abuse? Situation one, Alice imposes strange punishments on her five-year-old child. She's ordered him to sit in a chair for hours, lock him in a dark closet overnight, and cut off all the hair on one side of his head. Select an answer. Yes, this is emotional abuse, or no, this is not emotional abuse. How many of you would answer yes to that question? Would anybody answer no to that question? How many of you are really unsure and you're not positive which is the correct answer? Turns out if you're not positive, the computer program will help you. But since everybody said yes, you are correct. Discipline that unreasonably isolates or purposefully humiliates a child may be considered emotional abuse. So I just wanted to use this example as uh, something to let you know that this program is not scary, it is not hard. All I did was click, in this case with my finger, in some cases with a mouse. Um, to get to the next uh, question, there's only 
58 pages in the whole thing, and some of that is your registration process. So um, it's not a difficult program, and we'll help you get started with it today. Okay? So, what is required of volunteers? Two simple components. Coming to this orientation, where you read through some agreements that we can all say yes, um, this is appropriate and not appropriate uh, for how we interact with minors. And then the second component is the online portion, which will actually do a screening, such as a background check, and it will help you recognize what is of use and what is not of use. So, those are the two components there. And that essentially concludes uh, the, the formal training session. Okay, so let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for our volunteers. Thank you for those who, who really carry forward when the, when the rubber meets the road. They carry forward the mission. And I pray, God, that you would grant to each one here an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. That they would know uh, that they are valued and loved, but especially that they would be thoroughly equipped and joyfully involved in linking our children to Christ and linking others to Jesus. So thank you for the time that they've invested here. And I pray that um, as we part from this place, we would never part from your presence. In Jesus' name.